Okay. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us tonight. Uh, you have found your way to the Bucks County Short Fiction Contest celebration. In other times, we would be meeting in person and we would have flowers and snacks. So I hope you have some flowers or at least some snacks to enjoy while we do this. Um, my name is Professor Elizabeth Luciano. I have been running the contest now for five years. I can hardly believe that when I say it, it's sort of like watching a child grow up. Um, I want to thank the college for its support, particularly the Department of Language and Literature. There's a lot of administration help that goes into this and they also pitch in a little bit of money, which is certainly very nice. And again, much appreciated. So with me tonight, uh, I have our final judge, novelist Megan Angelo. Uh, also, our winners, Gabe Tenalia, uh, Megan Monforti, Jen Giacalone, and Lynn Levin. So um, I'm going to chat with each of them in turn, and you'll hear a bit of the stories. You will be able to read the stories in full later on this week if you go to our webpage. Um, just go to the Bucks County Community College homepage, search short fiction contest and our page will pop up. Um, you'll be able to read these stories as a read only format. You're not going to be able to download them, um, but our winners can then uh, claim that quite rightly as a publication. So uh, I hope that you will do that. Um, all right, so uh, without further ado, um, let me start with Gabe. Gabe, um, I'm delighted to have you here. You have kind of given us a little bit of diversity here, uh, both in gender and age, so thank you for that. Uh, Gabe is a recent college graduate of Ursinus College, is that right, Gabe? Yep, Ursinus. Ursinus. Mm -hmm. um, he is keeping himself busy with some writing and editing and tutoring. But the last time we talked, you were looking for full-time work. Is that still the case? Um, now, I've, now I've been doing some part-time work uh, just to kind of also leave time for the, the editing and other freelance work that I want to do. So it's kind of a mix of random okay. things. Well, I was, I was just going to put in a plug for you. If anyone out there has a good full-time job for a nice, hardworking, well-written college graduate, they should keep you in mind and they can find their way to you through me. So well, that would be great. I would, I would love that. <laughs> well, anybody got a job for Gabe, please step up. It's a, it's a hard time to be a recent college graduate. Um, so Gabe, um, Tell us a little bit about the premise of your story. Like, what's the situation? But don't give away the ending, okay? All right. Um, well, it's pretty, pretty simple. It's it's sort of very inspired by the the pandemic, the times we've been living in, and it's basically just about this this uh, this uh, younger guy, kind of around my. I don't specify in the story, but I imagine him around being around my age or a little older and he is you know living away from home unlike me and he is um kind of talking to his parents about he has a younger brother who has not really left the house or even left like his room for months and months and there's this sort of tension there within the family and so he arranges to come home while his parents are out you know uh you know, following pandemic precautions, and he is going to try and talk to his brother. And that's basically, basically the main idea, the, the driving force behind the story. So your story really focuses on not just trying to live and be safe during the pandemic, but also the idea of how much isolation and disconnection we're all dealing with. Um, were you sort of more inspired by wanting to write about disconnection or more inspired by just trying to um, document what we're all going through? 
Yeah, I think probably a little of both because I've written a couple short stories and most of them deal with the sort of themes of being isolated, being a little disconnected, usually having to do with technology in some way. But I also, you know, the the, the t- tried and true advice, write what you know. Um, you know, the past almost two years, I've known a lot of staying around at home and dealing with um, tensions about, you know, the pandemic and how to stay safe. And so I just thought, oh, I know that very well. Everyone knows that very well. I'll just write about that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's certainly very valid. Um, it was really interesting to see you write about the experiences, particularly of young people during the pandemic. Um, it seems like the pandemic has been particularly unkind to the very old and also the very young. Can, can you talk about that for a minute? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I have been very, very fortunate, um, even though I, like you mentioned, I have, I did recently graduate uh, back in 2020 and it was kind of derailed a lot of what I had hoped to be doing uh, post-graduation, but I was very, I'm feeling very fortunate because I have, you know, my parents, they've been very nice and accommodating and keeping me on my feet and letting me do the things that I want to do, giving me, you know, the opportunity to do that. And so I feel like I've had it better than most, I would say, I don't know for sure, but it's definitely, I think, I think the part that is most the part that I've noticed the most is the sort of, I guess, emotional uh, toll that it takes, you know, having to deal with that isolation being more, and it kind of gets into a pattern too. Like you do it first for your own safety and then eventually you start to kind of get comfortable with it, just staying at home, not really talking to people, not really seeing people. And it starts to be a bit of a pattern that's hard to break. And so that's kind of one thing that I've noticed for myself that, inspired me to try to put that down in a story. No, I I think what you're saying is something a lot of us can relate to, just even the ability to have social skills and converse with people, it like is suddenly much more difficult. Um, I'm hoping it'll be like riding a bicycle and and we'll all be Mm -hmm. able to get back to it pretty well. Um, I should actually note for the record here that Gabe is our first ever honorable mention. Um, He didn't place, but his story was too good not to mention. So I really do hope um, that folks will go online and read your story, Gabe. Um, What are you kind of looking at moving forward? What are you working on these days? Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to write a a book of my, like, like a novel. I know, obviously, uh, Megan is a published author. I, I believe some of the other winner, uh, the winners are also published. I have not published anything aside from some short stories, and I would like to, I'd like to change that, basically. That's, well, that's mean, my hope. That's great, and it's very doable, and you're right, your fellow winners show that it's very doable, so I hope you'll stick with it and, and mm-hmm. keep pursuing that, because you really have a lovely voice. Thank you. Um, so Jen Giacalone, um is someone that I have met before. In fact, Jen placed two years ago in fall of 2019, which was the last time we were able to have an in-person celebration. Yeah. So we, we met in person, which was yeah. great. Um, it's lovely to have you back again and see you again. Um, so I've got to get my notes. I, I can't do everything right off the cuff here. Um, Jen lives in Doylestown. Um, she's our first ever repeat winner in the contest. Um, she also writes poetry, screenplays, and novels, and is the mother of two sons. And her stories often explore the ideas of the role of religion in our lives, um, an international flavor, 
And Jen is also very interested in how marginalized people are portrayed in, in stories and how, um, how they fit into society. Um, so Jen, do you wanna add anything to that? Is that an okay intro for you? Yeah, that's, that's uh, all fairly accurate. Okay, um, your story, Wrestling with the Dust, um, really kind of plays with the ideas of a group of powerful women in this idea, I mean, in this story, um, a group of nuns as powerful women. I wonder if you could talk about what inspired you toward that a little bit. Um, well, you know, the way a lot of my stories get written, it's usually like a collision of a few things. Um, I've actually always had this sort of lifelong fascination with nuns and I'm not Catholic, so I don't know why that is exactly. Um, I mean, certainly the church is uh, <laughs> um, a fairly controversial institution, but um, the one thing that I can say definitively is that when you look at the good that the church does do, it's almost always the nuns that are out there in the trenches getting things done. They're the ones that are like, you know, working with addicts and, you know, taking children in bad neighborhoods to get library cards and like that type of thing. And um, I used to have a politics blog, actually, and I had the chance to interview Sister Simone Campbell, who was, until recently, she was the president of Network, and she was one of the nuns on the bus that was campaigning for, you know, when they were trying to pass Obamacare. Um, you know, she spoke before Congress, and, like, she was such just an amazing spirit, just like a really powerful kind of person. And as a group, I mean, there, there was sort of the four of them that was sort of the core group. Um, and I've always had just really admired them. And um, so I've always sort of had it in my head that I wanted to do something with these like social justice warrior nuns. Um, and then a while ago, I think sometime late last year, I was watching a series about um, like documentary series about art heists. And uh, there was a specifically an episode dealing with like all these mosaics that were ripped out of uh, churches that had been destroyed during the bombings in the 70s. And I don't know how, but those two things sort of collided and that's what happened was the, that story was the result. Well, I mean, it's, it's a lovely story. I love that it is set someplace different. Um, you know, you like to set your things not just in your backyard. So I'm kind of wondering um, what brought that about and why? You know, it's a big world. Um, you know, a lot of, I mean, I, I like to delve into fiction because I like to see things that are different. And, you know, I think a lot of people like to see, you know, different cultures and locations. And, you know, I mean, I love a lot of really silly, frankly, silly things just because they take you someplace else and show you something different. Um, and, you know, Cyprus and, and those, you know, war-torn churches um, just seemed uh, like a very attractive locale. And I got to do research, so. <laughs> you mentioned that you like to research and sometimes it's hard to stop. I do, I do, <laughs> I, love, I love research. It's like, you know, the hardest thing is when I'm writing something and I have to go, okay, I know I learned all of this, but I don't need to put all of this in the story. Like there's it, a, it is <laughs> fun. It can take you down all kinds of crazy paths, but then suddenly you realize you're researching and not writing. You know? Right. And that's, you know, that's the thing, but you know, like a lot of times and like, I'll just run across something and, and, you know, it'll go, bing, you know, and it'll go in a little pot on like a back burner in the back of my head where, you know, there's like six things bubbling at all times, so. Would you read us a little piece of your story, please? Sure. Thanks. When the workmen arrive at seven on Monday morning, they find Sister Dolores in full habit, chained to their bulldozer. It isn't the first time either. She was here on Friday too, and stayed in this exact spot for half the day until Sister Annunciata arrived with a briefcase full of legal arguments. Annunciata had gone to law school before joining the order, and although she isn't a lawyer, she knows how to talk like one. 
By the time the foreman figured out that her arguments weren't really sufficient to stop work, the day was more or less over anyway. Sister, please, the foreman complains, his voice tired and gravelly. You'll be paid either way, Dolores points out. You have a good union. But we have work to do, he persists. She understands. He wants the dignity of actually doing his job. But Dolores is unmoved. She tugs with a smile at her padlock, telling him she hasn't got a key. The half-demolished church looms behind the bulldozer, looking even more ancient than it is. She is 25 and has the stamina to do this all day. Besides, she enjoys the spectacle. It's been like this since the 70s, she says. What's a day or two longer? Cyprus had been a war zone then, and bombs had remade much of the architectural landscape. This old church had stood, a ghost of its former self, for many a year since then. He lights a cigarette while the workmen grumble behind him. Can you spare one of those, she says, pointing to the cigarette in his mouth. Clearly exasperated, he hands her one and starts to walk away. And a light, if you wouldn't mind. He stops. She smiles beatifically. He lights her cigarette and walks away, muttering in Greek. Dolores smokes until it's nearly down to the filter and then tosses it into the dry cocoa-colored dirt. She relishes the discomfort she causes. She should probably have a bit more humility, but she is doing the Lord's work after all. At mid-morning, Sister Barbara arrives, wearing jeans, boots, and a fuzzy cardigan, wimple intact. She confides to Dolores that she appreciates the theater of the full habit, but it's simply not practical for walking around a demolition site. She passes out homemade peanut butter cookies as thick as a child's fist and dispenses coffee from one of those portable cardboard jugs, disarming the surly workers with her sweet, youthful smile. Her tracks in the dark clay dirt are like a child, a child's next to theirs. Thank you very much. As you were reading, I just remembered some of the phrases and descriptions that I really loved. The peanut butter cookies like a child's fist. That just sounds like I want one of those. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually don't have a peanut butter cookie recipe. <laughs> I would make some. Um, well, thank you. It's That was lovely. And for those who are watching on YouTube, I, I hope you'll read the story in its entirety on our website. Again, we'll have it up in a few days. Um, all of these stories are really worth spending some time with. Um, our second place winner this year is Megan Monforti. Did I say it right? You did. <laughs> okay, from Doylestown. Um, after two decades as a journalist, editor, and copywriter, she now has her own business helping non-writers get down their thoughts and ideas and brainstorms. She's raising a family, so she wakes up early to get her writing time in. She calls herself a total word nerd. I love that. I, I think you're in good company here. Um, Megan has entered this contest before and may or may not know that she actually came breathtakingly close to placing more than once. So this time she's done it and we are delighted for her. Um, so this is a lesson in perseverance. You, you hung with it and here you are. So that's just lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Megan's story um, relies on the ideas of emails being sent back and forth between people. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us kind of what you thought that was going to bring to the story, the exchange of emails. Well, from a, just a simply pr pragmatic perspective, it kind of helps move the plot along a little bit, especially in a short story. You can kind of reveal things and kind of move ahead without it being too disruptive. But um, what I really wanted to explore was kind of the um, tenuous or even false sense of intimacy people can develop um, via email, hiding behind a screen, um, sharing things. For example, Lori was unable and unwilling to share with her own husband about her unhappiness, and yet she was confiding in her son's teacher, of all people. Um, and I just think that that's an interesting um, dynamic that a lot of people, a lot of people deal with. 
Um, you also had some kind of interesting contrast in your story. Um, I don't think it gives anything away because it's not at the end mm -hmm. to say that there is an unsuccessful marriage proposal, right. but there also seems to be an unsuccessful marriage. So did you do that on purpose, kind of having those as a counterpoint? Yes, I, I did. Um... Well, as I told you, the, the proposal story, uh, generally speaking, was inspired by something I witnessed uh, in real life. So I had that in the back of my mind, but I took it in a different way than it actually happened because I wanted to contrast that with Lori's perspective and how she kind of got married because she thought that was the thing to do and, and that was the next right step. And it didn't even dawn on her that, oh, she could have said no and how that might've changed the trajectory, trajectory of her life. And I also wanted to kind of highlight a generational gap, I suppose, because the girl's mother is fretting and trying to make sure that she captures this proposal on film and yet she's relieved when it doesn't work out. Um, because she wants more for her daughter than she had. Um, and so Lori is somewhere in the middle there and just kind of contemplating um, the choices she now has to make um, after making perhaps the wrong choice uh, 12 years earlier. Um, another issue that you explore in your story is one that we also, you and I kicked around a little bit by email, which is kind of the whole culture of moms as volunteers at the school and how women's unpaid labor often just makes the machine go. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, I am a, as a freelance writer, I, I have freedom and I have the luxury of being able to, I love to volunteer in my kids' school and I have been a class mom for five years in a row now for various children of mine. And it, it gives me a lot of joy. I'm not saying it's the easiest work, but I also feel like it's a, it's, it's not only a way to show my kids that I care, but these teachers these days are so overwhelmed and doing much more than they should. So if I can pitch in, I'm glad to. That being said, it's always the same moms who volunteer and we're often doing more than one class at once. And it's just, um, but it, it does, it keeps, it keeps things moving. And I don't think that the, you know, the class, the school could, could function without us. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I suspect that you're right. And I mean, the one payback is you do have a little more of a window into what's going on in the classroom than maybe some other people do. So yeah. there's, there's something back for that. Would you like to read us a piece of your story? Sure. Absolutely. I am reading off good old fashioned paper, so I apologize in advance for the rustling. <clears throat> the first message was lost in a sea of other back to school messages that had flooded Lori's inbox late last August. She went back looking for it recently and was surprised to see how ordinary it was. She had expected a spark, a clue, a subtle hint of romance or flirtation. Dear Mrs. Stover, thank you for the enlightening message regarding your son Cameron. I appreciate the time and effort required to tell me more about his interests and personality. I look forward to meeting him on the first day of school. Third grade is a big and important year for learning at White Pine Elementary, but we'll have plenty of fun too. I hope to meet you and Mr. Stover at back to school night, which is on September 14th at seven o'clock room six. Thank you again. Sincerely, Mark Davis. Land and nondescript, probably the same email he sent to all the parents simply changing the names each time. She then checked her sent mail folder to see if she'd responded. Who could even remember at this point? Dear Mr. Davis, please feel free to call me Lori as the only Mrs. Stover in my life is my mother-in-law. After 14 years of marriage, I still don't think of myself as Mrs. Stover. I don't think I ever will. I ask all of Cam's friends to call me Lori, so please feel free to do the same. I look forward to meeting you as well. It made her cringe. What kind of person wrote such things to her child's teacher whom that person hadn't even met yet? A pathetic one, that's what kind. Still, he'd responded two days later. Dear Mrs. Stover, thank you for your message. It's been my policy since I became a teacher 21 years ago to address all parents this way. I know it's formal, but if it makes you feel better, I know your mother-in-law and there are worse individuals to share a name with. Then he'd added a smiley face, followed by sincerely Mark Davis. Immediately, she'd gone to the school's website and looked him up. Light brown hair, hard to tell his eye color from the photo, which looked like it was from last year's yearbook. 
and a wide smile that seemed easy and genuine. Pathetic, Lori whispered now into her knees, though she wasn't sure if she was referring to herself or Mr. Davis. Both, she whispered again into her knees. She was sitting on the cold sand of Colony Beach on an old bath towel she'd found in the trunk of her car. It was warm for May in Kennebunkport, but windy by the water, and she'd left home without her parka and was shivering in her sweatshirt. She hadn't told Douglas she was leaving. She hadn't known where she was going at first. She certainly had no idea what she was doing. She just needed to leave the house. She needed to leave Ellsworth too. Once she'd been on the turnpike a few miles, she knew her destination. This beach was her favorite in Kennebunkport, maybe all of Maine, always quiet and less crowded than the others. She'd come here nearly every summer as a kid because her mother's sister had a house on Haverhill Street. She and her cousins would ride bikes to the beach when she was even younger than Cam and spend all day swimming, squatting in tide pools, looking for sea life, reading on their towels and riding up Ocean Avenue to get an ice cream from Uncle Jed's general store before heading home. Douglas would sigh if he knew she was here, deeply and in a way that conveyed his utter lack of surprise to be disappointed by her again. She squeezed her eyes tightly now, trying not to see his face in her mind. She saw Cam's for a moment and felt a quick twist of guilt, but he had a ride to soccer and hopefully he'd get a ride home. They'd have to figure it out without her this time. Good luck, she whispered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will turn now to our first place winner, Lynn Levin. Lynn, like our other winners, has a history of being an active and persistent writer, which I think is what it takes. Um, although much of her writing has been poetry. In fact, um, Lynn has a bit of a history with the college. She was our poet laureate in 1999. Okay, um, and she has published eight books, most recently the poetry collection, The Minor Virtues. She's had careers in advertising and publishing and um, teaches English and creative writing at Drexel University and also has taught creative writing at the University of Pennsylvania. So, um, so it is lovely to have you among our slate of winners this year. I am honored. Does it feel strange to be wearing the short fiction hat instead of the poetry hat? Yeah, we, we call that going over to the dark side in the poetry world. No, it's cross-pollination. It's oh, all okay. good. <laughs> um, so this was kind of interesting. Megan's story was a partly about messages going back and forth, and so was yours. So this seemed to be one of the themes that came out this year. Um, epistolary stories in addition to anxiety about the pandemic and about technology, which is something Megan Angelo is interested in. So just a lot of these threads were kind of coming out this year that, that was interesting. Um, so about your story with um, the epistolary nature, what did you think that brought to the forefront for you? Well, I guess it's, it's epistolary in, in some way, but mostly, it, it, well, the, the surveys could be seen as epistolary. That, that, that's the, the back and forth there. So um, my character, Jim Gulliford, is a, an office worker um, kind of a colorless fellow, but he is, you know, as are we all, inundated with surveys. You, you get a cup of coffee, there's a survey. You call somebody else, there's a survey after. Will you please stay on the line for a short survey? And I, I starting to get on my nerves, all the survey stuff. So I decided that I would write kind of a social satire story that involved that and, and involves the character's ultimate um, rebellion and refusal to stop to refusal to continue to answer surveys. I have to tell you now, every time I get one of those surveys, I think of you. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you are you deleting them? <laughs> I, I I usually didn't answer them anyway. It's like uh -huh. who cares what I think? You know who am I? <laughs> Um, you and I did talk a little bit about how your story has some resonance with Bartleby the Scrivener. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Well, 
as as my guy, my my protagonist started to refuse. First, he does all the surveys very dutifully, and then after a point, they just driving him nuts. So he starts to refuse to do the surveys, and I. And as he was refusing, I thought of Bartleby the Scrivener in, in Herman Melville's story, who's a, um, he's a copyist or a scrivener. And he, eventually his boss asks him to help proofread some the document that he rewrote. And, the, and Bartleby says, I would prefer not to. So he rebels against the boss and just decides, I'm just not gonna do this. So, when I remembered Bartleby, I kind of had a little bit of a model for how the rest of my story would go. And of course, I reread Bartleby, The Scrivener, and I, you know, love Melville. And so it was, um, um, it, it gave me a direction about how to, how to kind of create a few of the episodes in the story, although I end my story much differently than, than Melville does with poor old Bartleby, who wastes away in the tombs and starves himself to death. My guy does not starve himself to death. No, you, you do have a, a, a much less grim ending. That is, yeah, he, has a ta he has a tasty meal at the end of the story. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit when we chatted, you and I, about how your poetry has influenced your fiction. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm, I'm very... Um, interested in, in sentence rhythms, good sentence rhythms. And I try to include some similes and metaphors in, in my fiction. I try to um, use interesting verbs, very um, active verbs, reduce the to be verbs, as you know, all English teachers tell their students. So, and, and also, I don't like to stay on one idea for a very long time. I like to keep adding new turns of thought. So that's, it's, a lot of that comes from poetry. Would you read us a piece of your story now? Thank you, I'd be delighted to. So this is called, Tell Us About Your Experience. Jim Gulliford wearing a white shirt and a slightly frayed blue tie signed on to his computer at Union Analytics as usual, surveys swarmed his inbox, all do ASAP. A Qualtrics about yesterday's meeting, a doodle poll about the next meeting, a performance review for the new intern, an obligatory eval of an outside vendor with two dozen questions. This one even demanded that everyone rate the layout of the report, the background colors, the size and font of the type. Every time Gulliford hit save, the vendor survey crashed, forcing him to start all over again. 36 and single, Jim had the face of a man seen from a distance, the face of a man in a crowd. Bartenders overlooked him. When raising his hand at meetings, he was ignored. On the plus side, because he blended in, panhandlers left him alone and he could tailgate after others at keycard access doors. One of several data entry techs at Union, Gulliford spent his days in his cubicle, hands to keyboard, nose to screen, pumping numbers to analysts, who sat at nicer desks on better chairs and earned enough to buy themselves condos. With all the busy work and make work of surveys, when did the company expect him to do his job, which this week was logging in data about the sales of men's socks, no-show socks, athletic socks, mid-calf socks, and over-the-calf socks, with notably few sales in the over-the-calf kind. Then on to sock materials, then the styles, solids, bold solids, stripes, argyles, novelty patterns and such. Really quite a lot to men's socks. He glanced down at his own socks, which were gathering around his ankles on their way to bunching under his heels. These days you couldn't buy a bottle of booze or ask to have your modem reset without some wheedling robot pecking at you for praise. Tell us about your experience. Take a few minutes to help us serve you better. Rate your satisfaction. Write a review. How are we doing? And forget anonymous. Once Gulliford gave his banker an unsatisfactory review and the next guy, day the guy phoned to guilt him for costing him a bonus. This very morning his cell phone lit up with a text message, but it wasn't from the woman he met at the singles volleyball meetup. It was Frank's service center wanting to know how he felt about the repair they'd done on his vacuum cleaner. He respected, or maybe feared, the imperative and the interrogative, and he had an odd sense that the survey powers, like street cameras, were watching him. 
Therefore, he followed orders. Also, he liked to be helpful. There was that. Still, as he did his duty and filled out the surveys, he sometimes hated himself for wasting his time, his intellect, his freedom. The hushed music of the office, soft clicks of typing and the fragments of muscle, muffled conversation kept up its steady cadence. Barging into this came growls from Jim's stomach. No time to fix his breakfast today. Answering the vacuum cleaner survey sucked up all his time. He had to dash into a quick mart next to the office to pick up breakfast. As he toiled at this morning's surveys, sometimes 10 meant worse, sometimes 10 meant best. His Danish sweated in its cellophane and his coffee, which was end of the pot sludge to begin with, cooled to tar. Starving, his concentration interrupted by his gurgling gut, Gulliford plugged away at the latest time sensitive survey, hoping to get around to, his, to the Danish and the hosiery project. He glanced lovingly at the framed portrait of Amber, his, his cat. She shed quite a bit, so the vacuum repair meant a lot to him. As he selected the radio buttons, typed in his comments and advanced to the screens, Jim's brain wandered to the more pleasant subject of socks. He wondered if the client, the American hosiery, the American Consortium of Hosiery Informatics had annual conventions where everybody showed off their socks. Did the companies have parties and did they call them sock hops? Did they have Christmas celebrations with contests for the best decorated Christmas stockings? And did they have a podiatrist on retainer? An email alert chimed. The deadline for the socks data was 3.30 p.m., which he very well knew. And he suspected that he might have to skip lunch in order to finish his project. He hadn't even had time to try the unappetizing Danish. Was it to be a day of fasting? A person could waste away. After finishing the first three surveys, some imp inside Gulliford made him close the outside vendor survey, it was his third go, and delete the email that sent it. What a jolt he got from hitting that delete key. He felt himself launched into a foreign space, exciting, scary, and free. Would management notice his rebellion? Would they even care? He thought about the watchful survey powers, then glanced at Amber, who gave him a supportive look. Jim felt self-conscious about his sagging sacks. He bent down to hike them up, frayed tile, frayed tile, sorry, frayed tie dangling. Wham! His dipping motion upset the mechanism of his chair. The seat plunged. Something under the chair snatched the end of his tie and snagged him in a stranglehold. Struggling for air, unable to breathe, Jim gagged out, arg, and then his tracheal, ugh. He smacked his desk and choked out a few muffled cries. With his waning strength, he again smacked the top of his desk. All good, chirped Laura, the admin from the other side of the partition. What's all the racket? No, he wasn't all good. He was all bad, all dying. Ugh, ugh. He tried the tracheal sound again. Life force ebbing, he clutched his tie and tipped himself all the way over so as to crash to the floor and make more noise. He lay on his side, struggling for air, trying to scooch toward the chair to give his noose some slack. Good God, shrieked Laura, who came running with scissors and saved his life by cutting his tie in half. Jim rolled over, gasping the amputated neck wear, lolling like a blue tongue in the chair works. His coworkers gathered around as he tried to catch his breath. Jeff from IT unbuttoned Gulliford's shirt collar, unknotted his tie, and chucked the garret in the trash. Thank you very much. You know, it's funny, he is such a sad sack guy. And a lot of what the story deals with is grim, but it's so funny. <laughs> so Thank I you. love the sense of humor there. Thank you so much. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our final judge, Megan Angelo. We feel so fortunate that you were a part of the project this year, Megan. So thank you for, for reading uh, the final stories and for the lovely things you had to say about the winning stories. Megan has written about television, film, women and pop culture and motherhood for publications including the New York Times, Glamour, Elle, The Wall Street Journal, and Mary Claire. She's a native of Quakertown and a graduate of Villanova University. 
She currently lives in Pennsylvania and is the author. Oh, I'm going to do this so you can see it, I promise. <laughs> the book is The Followers. There we go. Um, and again, if we were meeting in person, we would have a stack of them in the back so you could buy one, but maybe you go get one anyway. Um, talk about anxiety with social media and technology and where it's leading us. It's scary, but you can't put it down. <laughs> yeah. so, thank you, Megan. I'm going to pass it to you now. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and thanks to all of you guys. I really, I loved reading your work and I loved getting to hear it again just now. It um, really brought me back to how much I enjoyed all of it. And it's lovely to hear it in your voices. I, I think um, you all stories are so fully inhabited that it's, you know, I feel like I, if I didn't know, I couldn't have matched each of you with your story necessarily just from meeting you tonight. The characters are all so real and independent and I just loved it. Um, I'm also really grateful to be here um, because my dad used to teach English at Bucks County Community College back in the 80s. So this is a very full circle moment for me. And um, yeah, and I'm just happy to be looking at people I'm not related to who don't live in the house with me. It's uh, a rare treat these days. So thank you. Um, I, there's something I want to talk with you guys about tonight. So I'm going to read a little thing first and then maybe we can sort of discuss the thing that's been on my mind. Um, that was a really nice bio that Elizabeth just read for me. Um, but I'm actually going to kick this off by reading you an alternate version of my bio. Alternate version, but just as true. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, just making sure. Okay, here we go. Megan Angelo has been passed over for jobs at such illustrious publications as Vanity Fair, Vogue, and Marie Claire. She has written numerous television pilots and feature films, none of which have been produced, but all of which have come just close enough to mess with her head. She did not attend the University of Pennsylvania because they did not want her to. In her early years, she was a three-time talent show alternate. She completed the guppy level of the YMCA swim lesson course twice before being allowed to advance. At the age of 13, she was honored with the distinction of being the only 13-year-old to still be an angel in the Nutcracker, while all of the cool girls had moved on to the Snowflake Corps. Megan is the recipient of over seven Do You Like Me letter responses in which the boys circled no. She lives in Pennsylvania with her family, most of whom are currently mad at her. So here's why I wrote that. Um, I wanted to talk with you guys tonight about rejection, which I know feels a little bit off because it's like we, we won something. Like this is the one night that we shouldn't have to think about rejection. Um, but I want to pitch you something here because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I think rejection is like one of these villains who has always been misunderstood. Rejection needs a movie where like Jessica Chastain or Lakeith Stanfield plays rejection and changes the way we see it forever. Let's look at the narratives we have about rejection. Rejection sucks, but you have to get used to it if you're going to be a writer. Rejection sucks, but it's all part of the universe's grand plan. Rejection sucks, but there's always a lesson. Rejection sucks, but there's usually a silver lining. There's truth to all of these. But once I started thinking deeply about rejection, I realized something about these narratives. They all treat rejection as a thing we should still avoid if we can. And after 30 years of experience, I am no longer sure that we should. Now, I'm not so evolved that I'm gonna sit here and tell you I celebrate my rejections. I don't need to go that far. No single rejection has ever felt good to me or right to me. That would just be weird and sort of inhuman, I think. But in the past few years, I've started to genuinely value the collective power of my rejections. In the same way I value exercise or spinach. I do not enjoy it every time, but I'm older. I get that it's good for me. And on that level, I'm starting to embrace it. I finally realized that rejection doesn't just make you stronger as a writer, it's the only thing that can make you 
stronger as a writer. There is no success that can guarantee you don't have to worry anymore. The only way to be unstoppable is to look down at your list of many rejections and say, damn, I guess I can't be stopped. It's funny to me that I'm thinking so much about this now when I finally have a published book. I always thought that if I published a book, I would feel legit. I would finally stop moving the goalposts I had been moving since I was 18. If I can just get that internship, that job, that byline, that column, that cover story, that book deal, the success will be irreversible. Rejection will never touch me again. Then I sold followers and I realized something truly horrifying. When you're a writer, even success is 85% rejection. It's just that once someone cuts you a check, they start calling it notes. The second you sign a contract to put something that you love and labored over out into the world, it will never not have a life of rejection again. There is not one moment, not one, where it is safe from rejection, literally. I can remember looking over the 40th or 50th draft of followers very late in the process when we were down to final tweaks and galleys had already gone out. The book was not even finished. I was getting hip checked by the copy editors left and right, but I could already go on to Goodreads and find a few one-star reviews. So it literally never lived a second, a heartbeat without rejection. I always wondered what the difference between being an unpublished novelist and a published one would be. It turns out that it's basically just that before I was constantly Googling famous writers, rejection stories before being published. And now I Google famous writers, rejection stories after being published. You get a lot fewer when you Google the latter one because famous writers don't like to talk about their rejections any more than we do. But I am gonna read you a tweet from one of those search results. Here it is. It took 20 plus years of intermittent submitting to get my first story in The New Yorker. Since 2016, I've had four stories published and five rejected, still waiting for the time when everything I write turns to gold. That's from Curtis Sittenfeld, who wrote Prep, An American Wife, and like basically has a condo on the New York Times bestseller list. So like, she still has more stories rejected from The New Yorker than she has published. That blew my mind. Anyway, I used to wait for the golden moment that Curtis describes there too. But the gift I'm giving myself now, instead of moving another goalpost, is to stop waiting and to stop treating rejection as anything but part of success. I realize now that my first rejection prepped me for my second, and the second one prepped me for the next 10, and the next 10, and 25, and 50, prepped me for moments like the one we are all in now, where the sting of a neatly worded, we thank you for your submission email, kind of pales in comparison to feeling like every giant system, public health, politics, parenthood, capitalism, is breaking in a way that sometimes feels designed to keep you specifically down. The last two years have been a moment of rejection on a cosmic level. And aside from anyone who happened to be collecting N95s just for fun, I think us writers were the best prepared. And I think we're gonna be even more resilient going forward because we know the truth, which is that the outcome of rejection is survival. So I wanna just open it up to you guys. And I don't know, maybe somebody wants to tell me what they think of this. This could be a coping mechanism that I've taken way too far. But if anything is resonating and anyone else feels like they've sort of gotten superpowers from rejection, I would love to hear about it. Well, I'll tell you, this is so funny, Megan, because I have been thinking about this very thing. It's funny because two years ago when I came this close to winning, you know, or to placing in this contest, I was, I was more bummed than I wanted to admit. And I was just like, all right, I'm going to keep entering. I'm going to keep entering. And this year when I won, like right before I was like, oh, if I win this year, it's going to be, it's going to be like really important. And it's going to, it's going to change everything. It's going to, I'm going to, right every day. I'm going to never have, I just had this like delusion in my head and I was very excited and proud to win, but it hasn't changed anything in terms of my daily writing. I like, and I, it's something I've been grappling with that. Yeah. And it's, 
it's such a weird thing. Success is just a little thing and you still have to do the work and you still, every day is still, you know, a day that you have to get through. And, and I think that's good. I think it's healthy to have that kind of view of it because like you say, Curtis Sittenfeld is still getting rejected by the New Yorker. There's no finish line, you know? And, and I think that is a really good realization to have the earlier, the better in life. It's just one foot in front of the other. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. My, my, my entire approach to, to, to rejection and just to creativity in general is to just, I, I, I affectionately call it the fire hose approach. Um, where I'm just constantly putting stuff out into the world and constantly submitting everything I can, everywhere I can, always working on something. So what that does, it's sort of counterintuitive if you're terrified of rejection, but what that does is it takes, like, it takes the power away. There's no one rejection that's gonna have that much power because you have a million lines in the water. Like, it doesn't matter. It's just part of the work and part of the process. And, and that, that was when I started doing things that way, it really, it really changed the whole way I thought about it. Well, I, I love everything that you guys said. And, and I, I feel that, I mean, I get tons of rejections that the story that won, it, it did have like, I think one or two very nice rejections with an actual note from a, from a magazine, which I call an acceptance, <laughs> but um I just, um, every time I get rejections and I get tons, I think, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll tweak that story a little more. I'll tweak that poem a little more and I'm just going to send it out there. I'm not going to let them say that this is no good. I'm just going to keep trying. So persistence, maybe, maybe, you know, editing a little bit is you, you might need to do that, but persistence. And then of course you have to keep producing. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's the really other really hard part um you can't just keep resubmitting that that story you have to like pump out a couple more so <laughs> you need more product yeah does anyone feel like they had a conscious moment in their life or their career where they were like i have to not let this get to me like, was there ever a rejection that just, I, I love what you're saying, Jen, because it feels to me like something that follows a realization of like, there are those times you just hang your hat on something that feels so special that you can't imagine that like everybody wouldn't rave about it. And then when you get that rejection, it's, it's crushing and it's a real, it's a moment of self-examination. So I'm wondering if anyone ever like consciously was like, I got to kick the habit of taking this stuff too hard. Well, I've been writing for, I've been writing short stories for a really long time, but it's only within the last year that I started sending them out. I was too, I I think I was too afraid of rejection or I just wasn't ready to put it out there. So I was struggling with that and friends would read my story, my stories, my husband would, and, and, and it was like the missing piece, like, just send it out, just send it out. And I remember I actually got excited when I got my first rejection because I knew that was part of the process. I mean, and it came like two days after I submitted it and I was just like, okay, like tack that one to the wall. Let's get, you know, the other ones. So I was kind of coming at it from a, a different perspective. I, I have learned to take joy in the rejections and maybe because I'm older now, I think if I had started sending out my stories in my twenties, I might still be curled up in a ball in the corner, but <laughs> I've developed a tougher skin. Well, one other thing about all these re- rejections is that there, I, I think due to the proliferation of MFA programs, there are a lot more people writing and a lot more people submitting work to magazines. And so you're, up against so much, so much more competition than you were, you were maybe 25 years ago. So I, I think that that's another thing that has to propel you to keep trying and keep submitting. And and let's all face it, you know, sometimes it takes three months for somebody to get back to you and, and then tell you no. <laughs> so keep writing and keep trying. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, there's a balance that you have to strike because 
you know, if you see, if you have a piece that you love and it's just not getting traction, then, you know, it's useful to go and look at the notes and see what the rejections are saying and be like, okay, you know, is, is there something here that I need to look at? And, you know, you go back and you, you know, you tweak it and you try again with it if you love it and if you believe in it. And, you know, if you're like, well, there's really, maybe there's nothing here, just, you know, move, move on, move on to the next thing. Dave, you've been quiet. Do you uh, want to throw your hat in here? Oh, no, I, I'm just taking it all in from, from people who know more and have more experience. This is very valuable for me, honestly, just hearing about the process and, you know, dealing with rejection and how it's going to, how it's going to, it's inevitable, it's going to happen. And I also, this is completely, this is not related, but something else that uh, Megan was saying really stuck out to me is that, uh, you know, you mentioned having like 40 or 50 drafts of the followers, which is like, I think that was also another wake up call. Cause I just, even the stories, like I've tried to, you know, I tried to write a novel before, but I didn't like, I can't imagine spending 40 or 50 drafts on one project that just, and I think it kind of ties back to what, um, I, I think Lynn was talking about, you know, persevering. I think I'm, I'm, that's what I'm learning from hearing everyone talk and it's really valuable and I really appreciate it because it's giving me a lot of, um, a lot of good, a, a lot of good things to keep in mind to help me in my own, you know, sending stuff out, trying to get published journey. Could I, uh, Megan Angelo, could I ask you something about the 40 or 50 drafts? Cause that, that really, that woke me up a lot. <laughs> Were those, like, were a lot of those your self-directed drafts or did, did your editor say, you know, add this complication or, or make this person meaner or something like that? I would say I did probably 20 drafts pre-sale of the book. Um, and on those drafts, it would have been sometimes just me. And I also am fortunate to have um, an agent, I have an agent and then sort of she, her close associate also reads and gives feedback. So with my team um, there, I did a lot of editing. They had a lot of great suggestions. Um, and then, yeah, uh, throughout the process, I mean, I'm not, don't get me wrong, not burn it to the ground, 40 or 50 drafts, but yes, going back, feeling like, oh my God, if I have to read page 67 one more time, I'm going to jump off a bridge. Like just... <laughs> Yeah, I just, you know, I mean, I've maxed out a couple of computers at this point with different projects because I am, I do a lot of drafts on my own and then the process also gets in there and, and makes a lot more. And I'm now, um, you know, talk about being stuck in the same story for a long time. And I, I love the characters and followers, but um, the book uh, has been developed for television twice. And so I've developed it for television twice. I don't know why I said that in the... Um, passive voice as if I had a nice staff who did it for me <laughs> but you know it's, I, I did that and now I'm doing it again and I'm, I'm really fortunate to be able to do that but there are times that I'm just like wow it's crazy how much of my life I've spent just tweaking this world so yeah. Do you think it will be, be made into a series? Um, I mean look the, I this is how I tell my parents because they get excited whenever I have a TV project going. I always tell my parents, it's like March Madness. Um, you know, you start out, you're in, in the round of 64, then you're in the round of 32. It's really, really hard to win March Madness. Um, so I've had a lot of projects get pretty far and I feel like this project is pretty much like in the Elite Eight or the Final Four, but you still just never know because Hollywood is like, I think it's like the last, it's when we're doing all the other writing and we're like, this isn't quite masochistic enough. What should I? And then it's like, yeah, try to make, try to make a movie or a series because it's, it's truly talk about needing your emotional tools in order. <laughs> yeah. And, and then there's the irony of promoting it and tweeting it and, and doing all the, the fame stuff that the book is about. So that's, that's an interesting meta kind of thing that could happen. Yeah. Yeah, having to promote a book about the evils of, of Facebook on Facebook. Like I literally went to the Facebook headquarters at one point and I was like, hi, I'm a huge hypocrite. I'm here to, hi. Um, 
So yeah, yeah. But well, I mean, like, I'm glad that you all, I feel less alone in the feelings about rejection now. I'm glad that um, you guys kind of feel it. And it's interesting. I'm glad, like, Gabe, I'm glad you're here too, because I feel like it really is part of the journey of being out there. And um, I'm sure you're not going to be like me, but in, when I was in my 20s, I was just insanely, my expectations, expectations were up so high. I was so hard on myself about writing and just, you know, if you can steal from some of us and, and mellow out quicker and be gentle with yourself, like that will be very good. So. What she said. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else they kind of want to throw out there either in response to Megan's questions or anything we've been talking about at all? Um, actually, just sort of broadly, I guess. Um, like, I mean, I know because there's a social media element to your book that you kind of have to be on there, but like to what, to what extent does the author platform figure into how you market your book and how people relate to it? Um, Cause I, I, I always like, I'm always so busy writing and I, I, I don't, I don't do what they say you should do with your author platform. Like I have social media, but I'm not doing with it what they tell you to do. And I sort of look at that with a little side eye, like, well, what I'm supposed to be writing. So um, like how, how important is it really, I guess? Well, it's important on the level that like, there, you will never run into someone, I think at this point, who's gonna tell you like, you don't have to do it, it's fine. Um, I mean, from, you know, pretty much from the moment I got my agent, it was like, you need to get your, you know, you need to get your profile up, you need to do all of this. Um, that being said, like go and Google an author you love and half the time they have like 500 followers. You know, it's, I just, I think there is sort of this really, really narrow microcosm of authors who um, are wonderful at writing and who are wonderful at social media. Kate Bear comes to mind, the poet Kate Bear, who's also from the state of Pennsylvania. There are people who have, you know, really great followings and who bring a lot of value to their content. It's just like a talent. Um, but at the same time, it's a ton of work. It's a ton of work that like, you know, if you are a writer, it's often hitting you right where you're already depleted at five o'clock, right? Like you're like, I don't, I don't feel like being funny. Like I just tried to do this for eight hours in front of my computer. So um, it, for me, was always a thing where, you know, after my agent was on me about it, the publisher was on me about it. It's definitely everything you've heard. Um, but at the same time, I really feel like you have to be true to yourself. Like I, you know, the past year or so, I just haven't had a lot to say on social media. And I felt like it's been better for me to be away from it. Um, so I haven't posted a lot and I don't, uh, no, no judgment on people who post their kids. Cause I'm like a taker. I love to see the kids. I'm like, yes, I want the Halloween costumes. Yes. I want the first day of school, but I, I just never got into the groove with posting my kids. Um, I think probably cause my social media started as something more tied to my work when I was at, like glamour and stuff. Um, so that's, I would say that, you know, I just, I don't have that natural urge or talent to just be really open and vulnerable and share my life. So I'm very erratic on it. We'll see. Um, if I if I sell a second book, I'll let you know if they yell at me and how it goes now that I've been you know, really flunking social media lately. It's hard to have much to say when we're in our houses all the time, although that's getting a little better, a little better. Anybody else? Any any last thoughts for us tonight? Thank you for having us. This is oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Thank you for coordinating the, the, this contest and and Megan Angelo. Thank you so much. I am t totally loving your book, and it has me really scared in a Margaret Atwood kind of way. 
<laughs> That's high praise. That is very high praise. Thank you, Lynn. And yes, thank you, Elizabeth. This was a pleasure. Oh, well, this was really fun. I, uh, I'm so glad that you all could make it. I wish it could be in person, maybe next year, but I do kind of feel like I got to know you all better than maybe I've gotten to know some of the winners and the judges in the past. So, um, so this has been really lovely. And I hope that your friends and our college friends who are watching along on YouTube enjoyed it as well. I, I think they probably did. Uh, so keep writing and don't get rejected too much and don't get wigged out about it. Maybe your story's not bad. Maybe it's just not one person's cup of tea, right? <clears throat> well, thank you guys. Have a great evening and a happy Thanksgiving and thanks for joining us.